President Mohamed Buhari approves the immediate relaxation of the restriction placed on worship centers. Lagos extends curfew to 10 p.m., but Nigeria's COVID-19 cases surpasses 10,500. What's happening? And election season is closed in Edo State. Osage Izeyamu and current state governor Gordon Obasaki battle for the APC ticket. This is Plus Politics, and I am Benny Ark. This is Plus Politics. Businesses are gradually reopening as the federal government has begun easing the lockdown and has just recently removed the ban on worship centers in the country. On the flip side, Nigeria's COVID-19 cases reaches and surpasses 10,500 cases. As the government made the right decision, joining us to discuss this is Emmanuel Uduare, a medical practitioner via phone, and also Tubos Nwakeju, a political analyst via Skype. Thank you, gentlemen of the press, for joining me tonight on the show. Thank you for having us. Great. All right, I'm going to start with you, the medical director and medical personnel in the building tonight, um, Emmanuel. What are the possible downsides to the approval of the immediate realization of restrictions directive given by Mr. President in the, in the light of COVID-19 and the increased cases? Um, so the epidemiological premise for social distancing is that you want persons who are in a public space to maintain typically about 1.5 to 2 meters, that's about six feet between themselves. Now, in most public gatherings, that's practically not feasible. However, um, gatherings in worship centers tend to be pretty organized. So as you've seen globally, the guidelines haven't been relaxed, have come with concomitant uh, prescriptions as to how congregations can meet. The downside is when you have congregations that do not have their facilities retrofitted for such social distancing. So if you do not have pews where people can stay one meter apart and designate how far apart chairs can be, the challenge and the downside are going to have a spike in cases of um, COVID-19. As we've seen in other climes, where congregations and other public gatherings like markets and all that have resumed in full force, and then you've seen a spike in number of cases, and Paripasu, the number of COVID-19 related deaths. Now, Tubasu, we've seen cases of guidelines being put in place, measures being put in place, um, the ease lockdown, and how so much unmanageable Nigerians were despite the lockdown. And now, here's a, here a different situation right now. Um, the, the imposed lockdown and um, restrictions on religious gatherings when is now leaked. What is the flip, flip side on this for you? Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think that um, government must, uh, it, looks, or it looks like government has succumbed to pressure from setting quarters. Um, I would have thought that maybe all the section of the economy would have been given priority to be open. Um, the, the, the worship centers being open is a very, very um, risky bit uh, because we have um, different, we have people in different socioeconomic class, you know, attending these worship centers. And the way they take information is definitely different, you know. And if that is the situation, compliance then becomes very, very difficult because if people at the top of the pyramid, you know, are very, very compliant, you know, what happens to those at the bottom of the pyramid where we have a large number that doesn't even believe that COVID-19 is real or don't be, they don't believe the severity of what we're having to deal with. So I'm really afraid about this move to open worship center. And like the doctor said, what are the chances, you know, that those buildings, those structures have been built, you know, are purpose built to be able to adapt to this kind of situation? So um, it, we, we, sh we should, you know, treat this with all the possible caution available, even following, you know, government's approval. Well, Dr. Manuel, in the last one week, there has been a steady rise in the number of confirmed cases and deaths reported from the virus in, in the country. Now, should we ignore the science factor in these over the opening of the whole economy? Um, okay, 
the challenge with the pandemic is its bimodal effect. On the one hand, you have a serious effect on the public health. On the other hand, you have an egregious effect on economic health. Now, the policymakers and those who are saddled with the statutory responsibility of holding the arms of power, acquiring the arms of power, have to balance both. You have to make a balance between living and making a livelihood. You cannot sacrifice one for the other. A matter of fact, one of the critical determinants for health is the economic well-being of society. So it's inevitable that governments around the world would have to open the economy at some time. The question is how and when to open. And that's what is the crisis that many countries are being faced with because the pressure, political and economic, to open is going to overwhelm the science of opening. The key thing in epidemiology is the ability to identify via testing, isolate the sick, contact trace their contact, and then keep them in the treatment facility. Now, we have to make sure that your health infrastructure can handle a potential surge in cases as we begin to phase by phase open economy. Now, we have a background of a critical weak infrastructure. So there's going to be a challenge as we have a flood of patients. However, what we can do, knowing our also fragile economic structure, is that we cannot maintain a lockdown in perpetuity. So what we need to start doing in terms of massive advocacy is as we are opening the churches, let's now ride on that path. The social pivots of society includes the churches and the mosques. So let's get CAN, PFN, and the Islamic Council and say, you guys have so much influence on your members. Please, we need you to emphasize that when your members are in the public space, not just in the church or in the mosque, but also in the market, let them wear a mask. Because they will listen more to those opinion leaders, believe me you, than we who are the scientists and the technocrats. Okay. So we need to leverage on the fact that these guys have that clout and start talking to them vis advocacy and say, if we can maintain some social distancing within the mosque or the church, then we're likely to inculcate it in their psyche because we are a religious people. We cannot run away from it. We need to leverage on that and help this and tell these guys to help us to pass across the message. If everybody out there is wearing a face mask, whether a cloth mask, and maintaining some form of social distance, then the truth is that eventually everybody will be out there, there will still be a risk, but it will be mitigated. All right, now, Dr. Malmo, many have argued that this will definitely give rise to an accelerated rate of more confirmed cases in days to come, just like you've rightly alluded to. Now, if you agree to this, if yes, how do we begin to create a balance between the science and the economic factor? Um, you do not want to create a false binary narrative where you have to make a choice between being alive and being economically well off. Again, we have to strike that balance. Yes, so the truth is we're going to have a surge in cases. The question is, can we contain it? And are we going to have a surge in the critically ill? Because the fact is, and this is very critical, what we have been doing is not what has been done across the world. Knowing this pandemic so far, with the little we know, what is critical is that 80% of people who have this illness would not require medical treatment. So what you're seeing in Europe, North America, and Asia is the 20% who are really ill that have overwhelmed their health facility. Now, in Nigeria, because we are scared that people cannot self-isolate, we are taking every person into the hospital. So most of the people in Lagos, for instance, in Ogun State, in FCT, and some other states who are in the hospitals have no business being there. What the states need to do, if you cannot have them self-isolate because you're afraid that they'll spread to their neighbors, then create an accommodation like a hostel and keep social workers there so that only the very ill will go to the hospitals. Instead of drafting doctors and nurses and healthcare workers to be taking care of 80% of people who really do not require treatment. That is feeding the 5,000. That is unsustainable. Olatubo, so let me come to you. Now, many people have expressed doubts in the NCDC's daily report and think that the government is actually feeding Nigerians with half-truths about the pandemic. What are your thoughts, Olatubo? Okay, um, 
I think again the jury is out on that um, because we still, um, I mean, the general knowledge out there is that we still do think that the government is testing enough, and um, but I think that um, NCDC is not feeding us false number. I think the problem is that NCDC does not have the capacity, you know, to test to um, to test as many people as possible. I mean, we've 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 not even tested up to. 100,000 people in Nigeria. So sometimes the only thing that gives us comfort today is that we have only about uh, about a 1%, um, um, a little over 1% death rate in Nigeria. Even Lagos, that is the epic sector, even seems to have about a 20% uh, percent recovery rate, which is way higher than you know the death rate that we're having. So that's the only thing that gives us comfort. Um, but So I do not think that NCDC, you know, um, is feeding us uh, false numbers. Now, let's talk about the, the imposition of curfew, the initial curfew that was, that was um, imposed. Now, do you subscribe to the idea of the initial curfew imposed between the hours of 6 a.m. to 8 p.m.? And now it's been reviewed to 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. Now, many people have questioned the rationale about behind this curfew. What's your take on this? I also question the rationale behind the curfew. Because if what you're trying to stop is the nightlife culture that we have in some major parts of the country, you've already asked the bars and the restaurants not to open at night. Uh, you've asked people to do takeout. You've asked people to close at a particular time. So for me, it's not clear the purpose of that curfew. So maybe it's six. Uh, if maybe it's uh, 8 o'clock to 6 o'clock or 10, o 10 uh, p.m. to 4 a.m., I still don't see the reason why we need a coffee. Unless the only thing that comes very close to it is in the, the interstate travel. Because at some point, there have been allegations that it's during the night that people sneak into the cities. But again, the interstate travel has not been lifted. So, I mean, I, I've been asking that question and I haven't also gotten any yeah, answer. Interestingly, to the that's logic what we've, also seen how, we've also seen how. Even the guidelines and, and measures put in place by the government have been flagrantly flouted. How can we ensure for full compliance if this is even possible? So for me, uh, from a communication perspective, um, sometimes you need to communicate the consequences of action to people uh, to be able to get them to take action in the right direction. And I think that what we have not been able to effectively do is to communicate to people why they need to take care of themselves and what the consequences are. So, for example, if there's anything that has been a bit of a guiding, um, um, that has really um, guided my own action as even as a person is to start to think, who do I have around me? Do you understand? So do you have older people around you? Do you have people who are more susceptible? Do you have someone around you that can now become, you know, um, that can now transmit to a larger number of people, and then by that reason, you have to stay safe. Even you yourself, you know, do why should you really, really, really stay safe and all of that? I think that government have tried, private sector have tried, but I think that that communication has also not been very, very effective because there are certain things that has, it has not factored in, which are also the, the behavioral pattern of Nigerians, you know, normally. So there are certain things that we need to properly, properly factor in. And like the doctor said, you know, um, you can't shut down the economy because you want people to be healthy because those two things work and in glove, you know. So, but what is very important is to, again, find that middle sweet spot that will get people to act in the way we, we, we are. I still maintain that, you know, um, the ch be opening the churches right now, uh, we do not have that framework to get them, you know, to, to behave in the way that we want them to behave. And like he said, the, uh, the, the, the religious leaders are very strong influencers to their followers. So I think the first set of people that we should have uh, converted before opening the church is converting those religious leaders and seeing that they have tried in every way possible to communicate these guidelines even before the reopening of so they sh they've shown a sense of good faith or, you know, there are the materials that have been given to them or procedures that have been given to them so that we are almost sure that when we now finally open, almost like you've done like a bit of testing of the process, you know, if you allow me to borrow that, that phrase. And then so that when we open, we're sure that people will, you know, maintain and follow the procedure that, you know, um, that is required to All stay right. during this. All right, finally, Dr. Emmanuel, let me come back to you. Now, Nigerians, right. Nigerians could be quite 
and on, on, on manage, manageable people. And in the light of a social crisis and your expertise as a medical personnel, what would you recommend at this point in time? Um, from a clinical psychology and cognitive behavioral science perspective, it isn't just Nigerians. Um, actually, if you do a comparative anthropology and compare society to society, I think just basic humanity are playing out. But of course, you're right. It's more manageable in certain states than others, and certain climes than others. I mean, if you look at what happened in Nigeria and just suppose what's happening in America, I'm sure you could see there's not much difference. I mean, what social distancing is happening in America currently, um, we have the same issue of flouting all guidelines. It tells you that humans are essentially the same everywhere, unless they have a situation where they have a vested um, interest in believing in the state, as you've seen in Scandinavian countries like Sweden, Finland, Norway, Norway and, and the like. So that said, what we need to do is to leverage on our strength. Our social pivot remain our religious and traditional institutions. And like um, Michael panelist said, I strongly believe that we need to convert our religious and traditional rulers first. We need to bug them on. We need to start having Obas and MAs, pastors and Imams driving the message, not just scientists and technocrats, because we need to leverage on those who people listen in, okay. not just government officials, because one of the paradoxes in Nigeria is that those in power are not those who are powerful. Dr. Emmanuel Oduari, thank you very much for joining us and for your insightful contribution on the show. And also to you, political analyst, Olatubos to Ikeju, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for staying with us. We'll take a break, and when we return, we'll be talking about the battle for the Edo State APC ticket. Stay with us.